Today is November 23rd, 2004, and today we will have a conversation with Patrick Doherty, where he will talk with us and our docents here at Grounds for Sculpture about Twisted Logic. Patrick, thanks for being with us today, um, and I'm going to turn the floor over to you and, and let you get started talking about Twisted Logic. Well, thank you very much. You know, the, the thing is that so many people here have already helped me, so I know that you already know a lot of what I'm going to say. Many people came to my talk, and that was great that you did that. I just wanted to mention first that, that Maggie, uh, my assistant over here, uh, knows everything there is to know about this, this, uh, this particular installation. And if you have any questions, you can always uh, uh, call upon her to answer something. Or if a stick pops out and you see it, you think it's in the wrong spot, put out the alert, the stick alert, and have her come put it back. Um, one thing is that these things are touchable. You know, uh, people are going to be allowed to go in and out of them, so that means that they're going to have to grab onto the sides of them to get in, and we think that they can, it can take that. One of the things that does happen, though, is that sometimes kids will fidget and come up and just start breaking off the tips, and so we don't would rather not that not happen. But if it does, it's not you know it's not just this huge thing worth screaming over. But you can say, don't break the tips off. But adults do it too. They just get up there and they start looking at it and start breaking the little tips off. So, you know, this is pretty worthy. And then the back, the sphere that we made back there, you know, we've made some kind of newel posts so that you can help yourself get up on that platform. And uh, we're going to test drive it next week to see it, um, how people use it or whether we need to signage it or in some way let them know they can touch and get hold of it. But really, we're hoping that people could just use that to kind of step up on that that plant and the inside. I thought I would just cover, since you all know something about my work, I would just talk about this installation, uh, just say some of the basic, uh, answer some of the basic questions first that most uh, students or so forth. I'm from North Carolina. I live in Chapel Hill, uh, North Carolina. I work uh, and make up eight to 10 pieces a year. I travel around the United States and have opportunities in Europe and I've uh, worked in Japan for six months. And so I've, I've got a bit of, um, of work for about 20 years. I started making a real living around 1988. Uh, so I've had a bit of time and grade in this. Uh, I've got a piece uh, nearby uh, at, at the Allentown Museum. Uh, so some people might say, did you work at Swarthmore? Yeah, I built the piece over in Swarthmore. I built the piece at Smith. I've got a piece in Brattleboro, um, of Vermont. And so I've worked a, a number of times in this area, and it's been great for me as people have walked in the door. They say, oh, I know you, meaning they've seen my work somewhere. It might have been in Tacoma, Washington, or, or somewhere. But um, you know, I like it that people feel so, such affinity for the work and then feel in a way that they already know me. Um, of course, I've had people tell me, your work is a whole lot better than you are. So, <laughs> as an insult. But, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I always flex these sticks a little bit, and I pull them through the matrix, and that's how I put the whole thing together. Uh, as I said in my lecture, I usually work structurally first. I build a kind of a structure that can take sticks I, uh, in this case, we've had kind of elaborate use of scaffolding. We'd put the scaffolding around it. Since we couldn't go into the floor, we would build the thing, and then we'd pull the scaffolding out and leave the piece standing there. And then once I've got a structure, I work aesthetically on it. In other words, I make a kind of drawing on there, and I use a lot of the conventions of drawing to enliven the surfaces, and that's what carries the burden of the illusions in these things. Many times, it's these flying lines at the top which is a kind of a drawing style. Like, the, what's really carrying the burden of the illusion is the shape on the far end. You know, we really don't have much of a surface lines that are conscious. It's just more like having that giant shape shoved into that small space. And, you know, that, and then the interior, of course, has got another kind of feeling. But, uh, so I work aesthetically. And then finally, we got working cosmetically, and that's what Maggie's doing this morning. She's going around, and if she sees a cut in that's sticking out of the mix, we put a few little sticks over it and kind of erase the cut end. So we uh, kind of a racing style and a fix-up style. We want people to be able to go in them without poking themselves in the eye. And so all of that is a kind of cosmetic fix. So some places above eye level, there's these flares of sticks. Below eye level, 
they, I mean, right at our level. And even for kids, you have to really work out. Uh, and uh, then a, a lot of times we really truly can't tell how they'll be used until we have some people walking in and around them and see how they, how they do when they try to get through these little holes. And because people will use things in ways that you never could imagine. Uh, the, the thing about this, and it's been so great for me, is that I can do work here inside that I could never do anywhere else. Because if you put something in an outside public park, there's no supervision. People have no ideas about how to use it. They don't even know if it's sculpture or whether it's a playground, piece of playground equipment. And so I've been able to make much more tentative work that has a, you know, some, some real subtleties that I wouldn't be able to probably build into an exterior space that is in a public in a public situation. So for me, this has been absolutely fantastic, and every, everything has gone so perfectly well for me. Uh, we've, we've had help gathering the materials. We had this huge volunteer force that helped us take the leaves off. We've had a constant stream of volunteers to come and help us detail and do some of this work. And so, you know, overall, we have really been ahead, ahead of schedule, and, and it, it's just been a, a fantastic situation for me. This is the first time that I've done something uh, over three months or done enough work to fill a big space. So I think of it as, as, uh, as kind of uh, a retrospective in, in my own way that, that there's some of the conventions that I've learned over the years I've been able to play out in, into these works. And uh, certainly the, the work at the far end, I never even could have conceived of being able to make a big sphere. So that, of course, that's not known for sure yet because it may turn into a hamburger bun. But uh, we, uh, we think we've got some little sticks around the edges that are our legs that are keeping it from falling. And at the end, uh, after vacation's over, after Thanksgiving, we'll cut those off because all this material is drying and getting stronger all the time. So it loses a lot of water, it gets much lighter, and it gets very much stiffer. And so that's what I'm relying on, and with, with my fingers crossed like this, that uh, as uh, as the thing dries, it'll stiffen up and really hold itself. So that's, uh, that's kind of, uh, and then in terms of talking about the way that the thing ended up in this space, one, one thing is that when you're doing a really big uh, group of pieces, what I'm finding is that you need to vary the show some because you don't want every single piece in this place to look the same. You never have that problem if you're just building one piece, but when you're building a number of pieces. So one of the things I started out thinking was that I would build a kind of an architectural piece because some of my work has been a bit architectural. So uh, some of it might be a big teapot or something, but that's still taking a tabletop object in, and making it into a kind of an architectural thing, you know, like a building uh, that you could go in, a little teapot you could go inside as a building, like a tea house or so. So, but anyway, I wanted to make a, a, a piece of architecture and I wanted to make it tall because, and I decided I would slip it into the corner of the balcony there so that I could use the balcony and there's a steel post in there that holds the balcony up and there's the steel girders that are underneath the balcony and all those were employed as a kind of, a, of an intertwining device, the railings upstairs. And so what that allowed is not only could you go in the base of it, but you could walk into the corner of it upstairs and kind of get another view uh, of uh, people uh, activating the space downstairs as they walk in, you know, you're like, whoa, look at those people down there, or you see them above and they're standing on the railing. So sometimes you can use just your viewers to uh, interest other people at looking at something. Of course, here uh, people are arriving and they really have a predisposition for sculpture, which is fantastic. Rarely have I ever been anywhere that actually people came to just look at sculpture. So that's a, been another very illuminating situation where people are talking to you and conversing with you about sculpture because they know something about it. Uh, so I, I wanted to do an architectural piece and then uh, in contrast I wanted to do something that had some rough edges. So uh, the piece upstairs on the far balcony is a bit of a nest looking thing with a lot of fringing and rough edges and also I wanted to, uh, you to be able to preview something happening up there because of that big, long, um, open space. I tied it into the rafters there so you, you can see it from, a, from below. And also when you walk up to the door outside and it, it's at night, you just see this big thing up there. So it, it kind of starts pulling the whole architecture, the whole show together. 
And uh, then I move towards this piece down here, which is based on just a bit of automatic writing where I was taking and making a kind of a doodle on, the grant, on a piece of paper like you would next to the telephone and then decided, oh, I would make a kind of a rough circle with, with uh, three, ring, uh, three loops out and two loops in, or maybe it's the other way around. But we laid that out in, in tape on the floor and then just saw what the results might be. So my overall style of working is just a kind of a reactive style. I know the overall feeling that I want it to, to have. I know that tower has got to be tall to be the tallest thing in the, in the show, so that if I can, but it's attached to the railing, so I have one big tall architectural piece. That means these pieces in here could be a bit shorter because I've got already one tall thing to kind of like as a pivot for the show. And so then I had a feeling that I wanted a, a grouping of things and maybe this, this line that went with the doodle it maybe it didn't have to be a solid fence that hooked these things together. Maybe it could be a much more ethereal uh, sense of, of something that kind of contained and surrounded. And so as the, as the tower is a kind of sense of containment and the nest is a kind of sense of containment, then this has another kind of sense of containment. You can go in these little cabanas. There's a, you know, kind of a hint of uh, some kind of village and that there would be kind of this kind of protect, protective flying line that, that went around the outside. And it adds a bit of dimension to the piece. When we had the five independent pieces, they look good. But also this, this kind of entanglement with, with almost the forest. You know, that these, these uh, things are not only are they they're little huts, but they came from the forest. And the forest is actually kind of hooked to them as this kind of flying fence. So there's this this forces of nature are playing out onto these, these things. And so these kind of pressure lines or flow lines or, or sense of, uh, of uh, movement is uh, it, it, it kind of built into the, you know, just a little. And, and it, it's a bit of reflective, like in the, in the tower over there, you have these kind of architectural detail, this little line that runs around. And you say, oh, that's architecture. You've got this other kind of flying line. And you say, oh, that's nature or that's pressure, that's flow, that's some kind of a, of a you know, natural phenomena. So to try to build something in that's both forest and habitat, you know, a wild place and, uh, and a kind of a comforting place for, for, for your viewer to go in, a bit of respite, you know. Uh, just, I think a good sculpture is one that causes a large number of associations in the viewer. That they, that's just not a single one line come up when you look at it. And so that's what I hope that this, this piece and these things as a group of pieces, uh, you know, that they have some kind of resonance for the viewer, that they're thinking about their childhood or a favorite tree that they played with. Oh, that's Mr. Big Mr. Twister. We've all played on that you know, large numbers, uh, uh, succeeding numbers of children have played on that, or, or simple, hard, and easy, the tree in our yard where you, as a child, you got to do the different parts of it, you know. So uh, um, one of the things that, as I'm working often, people are talking to me always and constantly about the trees they've known. And, uh, the, you know, the, the lilac bush we played under, or, or I saw this in National Geographic, or I just saw this bird nest in the, in, in, in my back porch. You know, and so they're, they're resonating with lots of phenomena in the world, I think driven by, uh, in some sense, uh, the loss of species and the, in, the uh, new interest in the environment uh, is kind of driving uh, underlying interest in it. And people are more interested in their gardens. You know, there's been a loss of agrarian life in the sense that you can't go visit your grandfather's farm anymore. So gardens like uh, Grounds for Sculpture become in, uh, much more essential places because they're substituting for kind of farm life and seeing growth and, uh, you know, and uh, being able to get in touch with something that's really crucial, and that is that we, we, ha we can just stand in a natural place and, and, and draw a great deal of sustenance from it and feel more human in, in some ways. So, uh, and, and, uh, so I worked on this piece and, uh, and tried for a kind of enclosure. And then we're working on the sphere down there. We haven't got a good name for that thing yet. Uh, so if you all come up with one, please give me some suggestions. But then that's an even another kind of enclosure. And one of the things that I was 
interested in there is to try to attach it to the floor in a different way. So what we did is take these big pieces of granite, we set them on some four by fours, we stuck a lot of sticks in under them like this, we bent the sticks up like this and got them to stay there and then put a top on that and then, you know, took everything apart and so far it, it's holding. But, you know, that, that sense of, of enclosure where the sticks tend to come in underneath your feet. Uh, so here you have, uh, you're walking in, you know, you have a solid floor under your feet and there the sticks kind of dive in under your feet in some way. So it gives an entirely different feeling. We started out thinking that we were going to have a skylight in it, a big oculus in the ceiling like we did in the tower. But slowly, we loved the way that the dome looked, I mean, that we'd made a fairly good sphere. So we said, let's not sacrifice that. What we'll do is go in and put a hard ring around the upper part, kind of describing an oculus, but have this kind of stick sky in there. So we wouldn't uh, make it too dark, but we'd have the best of both possible worlds. You could see it from outside, but you'd also have this sense of, of, of a kind of interior. And in a way, that it looks good because it's a scrim in which you're seeing the grounds for sculpture beyond it, but it, it kind of contains you in a special way uh, and, uh, and in a kind of complete com uh, enclosure uh, type place. So uh, I, I wanted to speak to a minute about the work being temporary because I think that's a great concern for people. You say, well, what's going to happen to it? Well, maybe one or two of these things can be dragged outside and set up somewhere as a kind of a, member, a remembrance of it, but the majority of it is, is destroyed. And, uh, you know, the thing uh, for me, I'm, I'm really a lot about process, and I love the piece I'm working on, and I let the pieces that I'm finished go, just like everybody does. You know, uh, you all have uh, jobs that you do, and they're all temporary work that you're, you're doing, so, uh, so am I. And uh, so I'm very intense about the work that I'm doing. Uh, one of the uh, mitigating circumstances is that I'm often allowed to use wonderful spaces if I'm willing to give the space back. And in public situations, all those spaces generally have to be negotiated with the public. But if you're going to do something for a year or six months or two years or whatever, you usually get by with it. And oftentimes people like it a whole lot better than they thought they were going to. So if you went on told the public, oh, where well, I'm going to make this big stick thing on your street, they would say, I don't think so. But if somebody is willing to sponsor it and then they, they say, well, it's only going to be there for a year, so I could take anything for a year. So, so oftentimes I'm allowed to work in, in, uh, in places where there's been an absolute ban on having any sculpture. And that can be on college campuses too. You would think they would be enlightened, but often many college campuses have no sculpture on it because they've got a kind of band on on having anything that's out in public. So, you know, I, I, get the, I get the value of that. And finally, I would say the, the, the real big thing is that this work is conducted in full public view, which means that we have constant viewers coming and talking to me. So I'm not in an isolated situation building something that I don't know how people feel about it. I'm not getting any feedback. I'm just kind of long suffering in my studio. No, there's a constant conversation uh, going between me and the public, and it's really a, uh, and the, all you folks that have volunteered, you realize that, you know, there's this constant, what is it? What are you doing? Well, I'm thinking this. I thought it was going to be that way. Have you ever thought about this? So there's this constant interplay between you and the public, and that's, uh, that's very fertile uh, starting points for many other things that you might do, but, but primarily it's a way of gaining some confidence that the work is hitting its mark and that you um, are being an effective sculptor because, you know, you want to know that there's some resonance with your viewers. Because for me, I couldn't work as an artist in isolation where there's no knowledge of the viewer. I have to be really keyed into, because I feel like that I'm in a conversation, you know, and I feel like I'm part of the world of ideas. Every sculpture out here at Grounds for Sculpture is tied into some idea pool and it's some of them are about the 20th century or maybe into the future. But, you know, I, I love being tied into everybody's thinking about some of their more tentative thoughts and some of their better feelings and the, and the better side of human nature. So maybe uh, if you've got a few questions, uh, maybe I haven't covered something. Yeah, Charles? Have you ever, have you ever worked indoors before? Yeah, I work indoors and outdoors. I feel like that there's no bad spaces. 
and uh, so I, I'm constantly trying to figure out what I could do given the circumstances. Sometimes it's a very reduced situation. I, I worked at the Smithsonian and I had such a paltry little space to work that I really couldn't do the kind of work that they deserved. So I'm, sometimes I just am given spaces that I have to, you know, I just have to kind of suffer through. This, of course, has been a fantastic space and an enormous opportunity uh, just for public exposure, but for me as a, as a growth experience to see what I could do in such a large space when everything was absolutely as, as good as it gets. Yeah. Always work with volunteers, or do you have a staff that you work with, or is it always this way with the public? Yeah, generally I work with volunteers, and, and uh, sometimes the volunteer situation, the that situation is is uh, organizational oriented in the sense that that maybe an organization wants to include volunteers, and that it and, in, and but what's happened is that I see the value of it now because it extends the work in a real way into the into the public sphere. And uh, there's lots of jobs to be, to be done. And so sometimes it's myself and one other person. But, you know, also sometimes it's, you know, this club or, uh, you know, maybe a high school would take me on or maybe a class, somebody's class, and they would just have a couple people over there helping me every day. Um, this, we've had a lot of work to do, so we've had a lot more volunteers. And we've managed to fold them in and, uh, you know, garner their best energies and really do some good work, I think. Sometimes people are, you know, are very intense on one stick and they spend a long time putting it in and some people are just, you know, one stick right after another. And so uh, the work is a little forgiving. So it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't limit. And we're, there's a lot of background work that needs to be done. So uh, by the time that somebody's practiced for a few minutes, they're able to really do a pretty good job. And if you come more than one time or three times or four times, you get a whole lot better. And uh, part of my basic assumption is that we all know about sticks, that we played with them in our childhood. There are in, if you see kids go through their construction phase, they know instantly what a stick can do. It's a huge utility. We played with, we've cut them out of our backyards and you know, we just know a lot about them. We almost have a genetic predisposition for them because the sticks were our first building material. So in, you know, uh, in, distant, in the very distant past, uh, hunting and gathering meant really gathering up what was ever available and using it. So we've really got that down. And, and somewhere this reminisces with those, those uh, and calls to those distant feelings that are, are buried somewhere in us as humans. It's been very rewarding to every, to all the volunteers, which is wonderful also. Well, I thank everybody, and we've just, we've had a pretty good time. You know, there's no percentage in, in having a bad time at it. <laughs> we, we've really done a good, a really good job. How did you get started on this idea, using twigs? And well, you know, sometimes things, I, oh, I say I lie so much, I don't remember. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, I, I just uh, probably calling upon some of the, the points that I've just made here is that, you know, I played with sticks and, and I, when I went back to school, I started looking for something that I could do. You know, you've got to say, you've got to do something, you're a sculptor. What materials are you going to use? And it's just the availability of these materials uh, because of urbanization, really. Uh, they're, they're constantly being cut back. Now they're using more defoliants and so forth, tub grinders and the mangler that can cut things, you know, in vast amounts, but uh, but still, there's a lot of uh, regrowth going on in communities, and a lot of that is just waiting for for redevelopment. And so, I'm going out and gar garnering those sticks before before they go under the under the uh, knife, you know. Yeah. I understand the temporariness of this exhibit. Do you have any permanent exhibits anywhere? You no. mentioned Swarthmore and Allendale. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't have any permanent work. No, I'm. Are they smaller than these? Are no, they, they're big. And they're uh, this one at Swarthmore is down now. It came is down. down there. Yeah. Okay. But people remember it. 
and okay. they say that. Uh, yeah, the, I, I might have 15 works uh, at any one time up somewhere. And uh, then, let's see, I, I might say that I'm, I'm going to Augusta, Georgia after I leave here, and then I'm working in Santa Barbara at the Botanical Gardens. And after that, I'm working in North Carolina at the North Carolina Museum. But then I'm just different, different things. There, all those, all those three are all exterior. Um, so I've just run through my year. I'm going to France after that. So I've got one thing right after another, and uh, on into 2006. And so they'll be able to catch me somewhere else if, if I hold out, <laughs> physically hold out. <laughs> Well, as a group, what was the largest sculpture you have ever made? Well, uh, probably over at Swarthmore, we had a piece that was 42 feet tall, so that was way up there. This this is a the largest group of of uh, work that I've ever made in one spot, which is which has been great because uh, uh, people could come here and see a lot of different kinds of, of you know a lot of different kinds of work uh, and uh, different uh, uh, kind of starting points for my work. I understand, does the drawing come after the structure is made, the basic structure, mm -hmm. or does the drawing come before that? You mean as I'm drawing yeah. onto the thing? It is comes, it? Uh, the, the, this drawn surface, or this kind of, I, what I try for is a kind of line logic where uh, I'm using the sticks in one direction, and so the tapers, are, sticks are tapered, and so if you compile the sticks in a certain mass and stick them all in one direction, it has a sense of movement. And then there's a lot of types of ways of Xing things that make it also have a sense of hopping. Looks like. So you should do that as, as you go. And at the very last minute, I'll go around and I'll fix up. And, and part of the, just even the cosmetics of it, I'll say, oh, look how tight we made this. We've got to loosen this up again. So sometimes I'll go make it more messy again and I'll add a, really big fat line to help directionalize something or straighten some kind of passage of it out where you think, well, this is boring. I mean, how am I supposed to look at this? And I'll, I'll start messing with a few lines. And, and uh, when you start putting, first start putting lines on, no amount of, no thing hurts or helps it. But at the last minute, one or two lines is really crucial. Because what you're doing is starting uh, and stating a set of parameters and then narrowing the parameters down to where you just have one, one line. Uh, that really makes it. Uh, you know, uh, uh, jewelers say that uh, a polish is nothing but a series of finer and finer scratches. And so that's, you know, basically deciding on a plate and then polishing it down to a finish. And so we're doing the same thing here. There's a way that you know when you're finished because you can't make any forward motion on the thing. You're, you're, uh, uh, for whatever reason, the viewers are often either skeptical or uncertain about when I would know I'm finished. Uh, but we don't throw in the towel just because we're tired. But there's, the fact is that the surfaces start finishing themselves a little bit. And then you've closed down all the options. And then you're, you're finished with that piece and can start another piece. If you think of something good, don't try to add it into the, the top of this one. Go ahead and finish this one and start another one. We've had a number of great school groups that have come through. Uh, and so I'm sure you'll get more. But they're great because they really, uh, they, uh, we have a picture or some, look at that! <laughs> you know, it's like, a, uh, uh, that's what makes it worth it, you know, because you really feel like you've connected on some, on the, some uh, essential level with the viewer, you know, and, uh, and the kid in us all, I guess. Do you have a basic idea when you start what the entire piece should look like or, or does no it, I, uh, I I'm very reactive in what I do like I'll set some kind of an idea up like I did with this with this doodle first and then trying to imagine what each of these little loops on the doodle meant or what it would meant and then as I start forming it up I I might I started with the front one there and I learned some things this this front cabana thing I learned some things there and then I I started saying well where would, how would this one, this next one go? Would it lean into that or would it lean away from that? So all of them, they tend to 
you know, lean different directions, and it gives a sense of, of a shucking and jiving in a way. You know, they're, they're kind of, you know, moving. And, uh, and uh, part of that was achieved when we had our scaffolding up. We, we pulled the sticks one way, and then we worked on them, and then we pulled them back the other way, and then we worked on them so that we were, you know, we were uh, freezing a part of the form and then had some tendrils up there. Then we pull those tendrils back. And so, you know, by pulling them back and forth, we, we got more gesture into the, into the work. So a lot of that is just uh, experience and then also just being able to react. One of the things that's really one of my best qualities is to be able to, to not, is to react really fast to things and uh, to look at something and just make snap judgments without very much deep thinking about it and just cruise along on it. And, in other words, I capitalize on opportunity. Once I cast my lot, then I try to make the best of it. Uh, there's a certain fear of failure going on in there. You know, you think, I could fail. And in a way, that's one of the great things about doing this work. There's, there's, uh, it's not, you're working in public and there are the, there's a high chance of failure. You know, so, but that keeps everything fresh where you know you can't say oh I've done that before I know just what to do you really don't know what you're doing half the time so this is the this is a, uh, a exciting place to be for a sculptor yeah when you say failure do you mean that it won't stand up what do you mean by failure that it won't stand up that it will fall apart or? well there I think there's just the structural part of it but there's also uh, you know, here you have your sponsor, and they're going to lie to you and say it's good, mainly. But the, but the person who you're really reaching for is the most casual viewer. That's your responsibility, is one-on-one -on -one with them. And, uh, and that means that, that that viewer could be very uneducated or very educated. And so, you know, you have to reach into, their, into some place and get their attention. And so that's the, the basis of success and failure that I really think. You know, is it too hackneyed? Does it look like Disneyland? Where are the cut lines between being, uh, you know, too prim, too this, too that? Uh, doesn't fit the space well. You know, one of my, one of my uh, another good strength is that I seem to be able to, to uh, put things in spaces in a way that encourage I mean, to, uh, that enhance the space and enhance the, the feeling of the sculpture, you know, to play things off and, and to uh, gain knowledge about that space as I'm there. Not just know it when I come, but take its full measure as I start to work and then play off of things that I see out of my peripheral vision. Sometimes I'll look around after I'm finished and I'll say, oh, look at that tower top. I just reproduced it. I didn't realize that. And I didn't realize, oh, and just pulling in lots of, Maybe architectural elements, or the feeling of space, or occupying a big corner that uh, just seemed like it was needing something to fill it up, and you know, play it out, playing it out. So that's that success. Really means not just falling over because everybody can pull that off, but that you're still it's a, it feels good to the public, and that they're still causing a lot of stirring feelings in them. You know. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. And um, I'll have to give it over to you as the guides now. <laughs> <laughs>
She pulls you in Feel the enchantress In your loneliness In the unexpected She pulls you in You will drink her wine As she turns you in this wine She doesn't mean to be unkind Her control controls her mind It pulls her in Touch the enchantress Be the silk